Good morning. Um, thank you all for joining us this morning at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, U.S., the Washington home of the IISS. Uh, my name is Sam Sharif, Senior Fellow for Russia and Eurasia. And we're very pleased to have here this morning uh, Matthew Wiemuth, who's uh, a consulting senior fellow at the Russian Eurasia here at the IISS US. He is also, during the 2013-2014 academic year, a public policy scholar in residence at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, where he is completing a book project on Russian policy towards Asia. Uh, Dr. Wiemuth is on leave from the US Department of State, where he serves as senior analyst of Russian foreign policy in the Office of Analysis for Russian Eurasia Bureau of Intelligence and Research. Um, and in that capacity, he's primarily responsible for Russian policy towards uh, the Asia Pacific region. Um, we're very pleased to have Matthew here today to talk to us about the Russia Japan relationship and the potential, perhaps, in the coming years for a breakthrough in it. So uh, I'll turn it over to Matthew, who will deliver his remarks, and then we'll have a question and answer session. Thanks. Well, thank you, Sam, and uh, thank you all for coming out on this cold day. Uh, let me uh, start off by saying that um, I can barely get my children to believe that uh, my views are influential in the United States government, but just in case this needs to be said, uh, my views are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Department of State uh, or the uh, Bureau of Intelligence and Research. So there's an excellent chance that the so-called Northern Territories dispute between Russia and Japan is in its penultimate or even perhaps in its final chapter. For the first time in more than 60 years, both sides seem to agree on a fundamental point. Namely, that resolution will require both sides to make concessions on long-held and fiercely defended positions. This is a key turning point in any negotiation, but it has taken these two parties years to reach it. Until very recently, the intensely politicized nature of the issue and its intersection with state sovereignty, security, ideology, and national dignity has seen vocal players on both sides equate concessions merely with treason. By the end of the 1990s, the two sides were moving forward towards a joint approach to the problem based on certain key treaties and declarations, most notably the Joint Declaration of 1956 that stipulated the return of two islands to Japan after the conclusion of a peace treaty officially ending the state of war that has existed between them since 1945. In 2000, Russia's new president, Vladimir Putin, recognized the 1956 Joint Declaration in a typically dramatic gesture aimed at transforming the tone of regional negotiations and stepping back from the all or nothing uh, positions that each had defended for decades. For the past 12 years, the Japanese government had struggled to respond to Putin's gesture in a way that, would, that Moscow would consider meaningful and that might move forward the negotiations. While it has repeatedly voiced the need for mutually agreeable solutions, Tokyo has found it difficult to step back from its traditional claim on all four islands. Russia's role in the ongoing drama has been limited to varying degrees of impatience, climaxing in the two-year period between 2009 and 2011, when a frustrated Moscow seemed to imply that it might close the door once and for all on the territorial negotiations, and regard Japanese claims as a threat to Russian border security. However, Russia's swift assistance to Japan after the Great East Japan earthquake and the tsunami of March 2011 transformed the tone of negotiations virtually overnight. The return of Shinzo Abe to the post of prime minister last year brought a number of uh, Japan's, I'm sorry, in 2012, I first gave this lecture in 2013, um, uh, first uh, brought a number of Japan's most controversial and creative thinkers on this dispute to positions of influence in Tokyo. If the Abe government remains in power beyond the next few months, retaining the kind of support that it currently enjoys, it seems possible, even likely, that Russia and Japan will make real progress toward the mutually acceptable solution both sides have spoken about for years. So with that introduction out of the way, um, let's get to the details. 
The only thing I want to say about the origins of this dispute is to just talk a little bit about the 1956 uh, declaration, which is at the cornerstone of this. Um, in 1956, 55 actually, but going into 1956, uh, the Soviets reached out to the Japanese in a bid to uh, uh, end the state of war that continued to exist between the two of them. They still had not signed a peace treaty uh, because of some complications that uh, surrounded the San Francisco Peace Treaty, and um, they needed to restore diplomatic relations, etc. They they reached an agreement in, by which the Russians agreed to return the closest two islands uh, to Japan, Shikotan and Habomai, and the status of the other two islands, Eiperoku and Kunashiri, were left uh, un, uh, uncommented on. And as a result of this treaty, they would also restore diplomatic relations, uh, Japan would be allowed into the, uh, into the United Nations, and a number of other diplomatic uh, results would occur. Before the transfer of the two islands, oh, and, and most importantly, a peace treaty would be signed, uh, ending the state of war between them. Before the peace treaty was signed, however, following, of course, the, the signing of the, uh, the joint declaration. The, uh, the United States and Japan signed their security treaty in 1960. Now the whole point of the 1956 negotiations for the Soviets had been to neutralize Japan. And they were looking to get some sort of a, uh, an, an Austria-style treaty that would basically pull Japan out of the, uh, the, um, the split in the Cold War and neutralize it. The signing of the security treaty with the United States in 1960 basically obviated that effort, uh, and Japan was clearly on the side of the United States in the Cold War. So Japan uh, basically declared the, the, um, the joint declaration of 1956 null and void. The two islands were not returned, a peace treaty was not signed, and the two uh, countries basically went uh, to the state of Cold War that existed until basically the closing uh, and the fall of the Soviet Union. Moscow refused to recognize the 1956 Joint Declaration until 2000. When uh, Vladimir Putin became the uh, president of Russia, he made his first visit to Tokyo in September of 2000. And this visit completely transformed the bilateral relationship. Because after years of negotiations based upon uh, a refusal of either side to concede on this territorial dispute in which the Soviets basically said, there is no dispute, these four islands belong to us. And the Japanese said, we need to have a return of all four islands, not just two. The, uh, uh, Putin came to Tokyo and said, we recognize that there is legal validity in the 1956 Joint Declaration. Effectively saying, when we come to some sort of an agreement here, we will return two of the islands to you. So this was the first step back from the all or nothing negotiating stance that the two sides had had for decades. And effectively, the Russian position was your turn. In fact, Alexander Panov, who was the ambassador to uh, Japan at the time, the Russian ambassador to Japan, said as much in his memoir that the Russians felt that they had made their concession. It was time for the Japanese to step up and make some sort of similar gesture. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which I may reference as MOFA, that's generally speaking what they call themselves, uh, MOFA moved towards a, um, a, a diplomatic approach that um, was characterized by parallel talks, effectively pocketing the two islands, Shikotan and Habamai, saying, okay, we've taken care of that, we'll, we'll negotiate that return on the one hand, and looking at Eizuropu and Kunishiri as sort of a separate, unresolved issue. However, this created a lot of confusion in Japan itself because a very powerful Diet member named Muneo Suzuki, who was from Hokkaido and who was heavily involved in, with the foreign ministry in uh, negotiations with the Russians and who had some real political opponents in Japan, suddenly found himself at the center of a uh, corruption scandal. And this scandal pulled in the, uh, the whole Russian policy, and the accusation that was made was that the, that 
the diplomats at MOFA who were negotiating this parallel structure were in fact planning on giving away Eitoroku and Kunashiri wholesale, just pocketing those other two islands, Shikotan and Habamai, and, and uh, calling it quits. This was sufficient to uh, get um, uh, 30 diplomats reassigned or jailed uh, on, a, on a collection of different uh, corruption charges. And effectively, Russia, the Russia school at MOFA was completely gutted. Uh, in fact, the Yomiuri Shimbun, uh, one of Japan's leading newspapers, said Japan's diplomacy toward Russia is on the verge of collapse. Territorial negotiations were effectively frozen for the next five years because any effort to make any kind of headway immediately ran afoul of uh, domestic politics in Japan and uh, resulted in accusations of giving away the store, et cetera, et cetera. So the Japanese were frozen and, and unable to make the kind of gesture that the Russians had been waiting for uh, following Putin's recognition of the 1956 declaration. In March 2006, ambas uh, the ambassador uh, to uh, the Russian ambassador to Japan, Alexander Losyukov, actually made an extraordinary statement in a uh, an interview. With Japanese, with the Japanese press. He said that concessions beyond the 1956 uh, joint declaration were possible if the Japanese would simply make some concessions of their own. So effectively, Moscow is saying through its official representative in Japan that a negotiated solution is possible here if you would just back away from this insistence uh, on getting all four islands back. Um, in July 2006, Losyukov expressed basically regret that the, Jap the Japanese did not seem to be willing to, to respond to his offer, saying that uh, Russia was ready to accept a solution based on <coughs> concessions, but clearly Japan was not. In September 2006, However, Shinzo Abe became prime minister for the first time. And his foreign minister, Taro Aso, almost immediately said that Japan might be willing to consider a formula that had been suggested by Japanese academics to split the territory that was disputed between the two sides, uh, basically 50-50, not two islands and two islands, but by dividing up the actual territory. Uh, this was actually uh, the academics who came up with this at Hokkaido University had looked at the 2004-2005 uh, Russia-China uh, territorial agreement that had resulted in their border arrangement. Incidentally, the first border arrangement that resolved all territorial disputes between Russia and China for 400 years um, and basically that had been done by taking all of the territory that was disputed, drawing a line through the center of it and saying, you got that half, we get this half, everybody's happy. And in fact, that had been true. Everybody had pretty much been happy with this. Uh, so what the uh, professors at Hokkaido University said was, why don't we do the same thing here? Let's look at the territory we've got. As it turns out, Eturoku, the island that's closest to uh, the Kuril chain going up towards Russia, is roughly half of the territory uh, that we're talking about here. So Kunishiri, uh, Shikotan, and Abamai could be returned to Japan, and that would constitute effectively a half uh, of the territory, and Russia would hang on to Eitro. So Taro Aso said Japan ought to consider this, and uh, he called for what he said a political decision of senior officials, rather than leaving this to uh, diplomats or someone to negotiate. He recognized that, that in order for this to happen, the prime minister in his office was going to have to make a political decision to say, all right, we're stepping back from this. We can't leave this to the diplomats to negotiate. Lavrov, importantly, did not reject this idea. It was proposed to him in a press conference by uh, some Japanese uh, 
um, journalist. <coughs> and what he said was very telling. Rather than dismiss out of hand the idea that, that uh, Russia would actually concede more than uh, the two islands it had already promised, what Lavrov said was, if Japan has a serious proposal to make to me, I shouldn't be hearing about it first from a journalist. I should be, you know, they should make this formally, which was effectively an invitation to hear more. However, that opportunity did not occur because the foreign ministry, MOFA, immediately contradicted its own foreign minister and said, this is not, in fact, where Japan is going, and, uh, and rejected that, that Japan was seriously considering this. Also, nonetheless, actually raised this again in the Diet in December of 2006. He told them, if we continue to debate over the two islands or the three islands without taking into consideration their actual size, these discussions will never get anywhere. So clearly, Taro Aso is thinking in terms of territorial splits uh, and, and looking for some sort of concessionary solution. MOFA, however, corrected his, uh, his statements once again publicly saying these were just the foreign minister's personal opinions and did not in fact reflect uh, Japanese policy. When Dmitry Medvedev became president of the Russian Federation, uh, a new Japanese uh, prime minister uh, took the reins as well, Taro Aso. And uh, in February 2009, President Medvedev proposed an unconventional solution to the dispute. And Prime Minister Aso, reflecting his earlier willingness to consider some sort of, of uh, creative solution, welcomed this idea. And he once again told the Diet in February 2009, there will be no progress with Russia saying two while we are saying four. And he said also, we can't leave this issue up to officials. There is no other way than for politicians to solve it. So once again, he's saying, look, this is going nowhere. If we keep saying four, and they keep saying two, you know, at some point a politician has to step up and make a hard decision here. Uh, in April of 2009, Vice Foreign Minister Shin, uh, Shintaro Yachi, who was heavily uh, or closely involved with the negotiations with the Russians and was one of their Russia specialists, uh, proposed what he said, a three and a half to a half solution. Rather than three and one, he said, how about if we get half of Eitoroku, Kunishiri, Shikotan, and Habumai, and the Russians keep half of uh, Eitoroku? Is that, is that at all possible? Once again, MOFA came out and said that, uh, and, and basically reprimanded him in public, the vice foreign minister, um, and Yachi came out and said that he had been misquoted. Um, and uh, the foreign minister, or the, uh, the prime minister said that Japan's true policy was that while they wanted all four islands back, <coughs> their concession was they would allow Russia to determine the pace and the timing of the return of all four islands. The turning point of this whole issue for the worse happened in May of 2009 <laughs> as Putin was returning from Japan. He had had, he had, had a visit to Japan that had actually gone rather well. And um, he was asked about the whole question of the 1956 Joint Declaration um, while he was in Mongolia. And he was reminded of the Japanese claim that Russia was obliged by law that is to say, legal recognition of the 1956 Joint Declaration. By law, it must return the two uh, islands, Shikotan and Alamai. And he actually disagreed with this. He said, no, 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 this is, this is nonsense. We are returning these two islands. We are making this offer out of basically the goodness of our heart. This is a gesture in order to drive forward relations. This is not something that we are legally obliged to do. Well, of course, Taro Aso had to respond to this. He couldn't simply let this pass. Uh, and so Aso's response was basically to refer to uh, Russia's illegal occupation of the islands at the end of World War II. 
So now you have the Russians apparently stepping back from their recognition that the 1956 jo Joint Declaration has legal status, and the, and the Japanese now saying, you know what, that was an illegal occupation. So by, by uh, uh, the standards of international law, we should be getting these back. So suddenly you, su you find these two sides um, uh, drawing the line in the sand, and in uh, June 2009, the Diet revised, the Japanese Diet, revised the 1982 law calling the islands an integral part of Japan. The Russian <laughs> foreign ministry responded by saying that the notion of, a, of an island return has not, is not, and never will be considered. So effectively, all discussions about even giving Shikotan and Habamai off the table. Fine, you guys want to play hardball? We'll play hardball. So this situation by 2010 is spinning out of control. The deputy foreign minister, Andrei Denisov, in January 2010 said, in the late 1950s, certain formulas for resolving this question existed. But I'm not saying right now that it's necessary to return to this. Again, 1956 joint declaration, off the table. So. Um, you know, uh, basically the Russians have grown impatient. For 10 years they've been waiting for the Japanese to respond in kind to uh, Putin's uh, uh, gesture of stepping back from the all or nothing <coughs> position and, um, and this is sort of where this has led to. Now it's important to see this in the overall context of where Russia was at this time because uh, Russia was starting to rediscover Asia by 2006. The region is, as you all know, rich in resources, but it had been collapsing effectively demographically ever since 1991 and the collapse of the Soviet Union. In 2006, a plan was hatched in Moscow to channel $580 million into the Kural Islands, including the, uh, the four disputed islands, effectively to try and build up what, what was a crumbling infrastructural base there. This included upgrading the 1930s era defensive emplacements on those islands. And if you know what the islands look like uh, or where they're located, uh, they basically constitute a gateway to the Sea of Okhotsk. So the Russians regarded them as important to the defense of Russia, and yet they had 1930s era uh, military hardware there. So basically in 2006, uh, this discussion begins about how do we renovate this area, both militarily and infrastructurally. In July 2010, the Vostok 2010 military exercises included, for the very first time ever, military exercises on Eitropu, one the, uh, the largest of the disputed islands. And the Japanese were not pleased at all. It seemed to Japan that the remilitarization of these islands and these new exercises were effectively saying to Japan that um, we regard you as a security threat and we want nothing to do with negotiations. In November 2010, President Medvedev made the very first visit to the <coughs> disputed islands, he visited Eturopu, that any Russian or Soviet leader had ever made. This seemed to signal that Eturopu and Kunishiri, at least, were off the table. Sergei Prikotka, who was Medvedev's foreign policy advisor, said Russia would never re review its sovereignty over the Kuril Islands group. He said this publicly. President Medvedev said the islands remained an inseparable part of Russia. He did not distinguish between which islands he was talking about. So this was clearly a hardcore moment of Russian policy assertion. So here we are at the end of 2010, and it's very kind of you to follow me through this timeline. I know this can be a little mind-numbing. Uh, but uh, relations have basically collapsed. Negotiations are basically at a standstill. Both sides are not only asserting their uh, all-or-nothing policies, but the Russians seem to be militarizing against Japan. Japan is in a panic now, uh, trying to wonder if this means that a, a security threat could be posed against Hokkaido. It's all bad. And then, deus ex machina. It was 
the great East Japan earthquake in March 2011 that completely transformed all this like an act of God. The tone of this relationship transformed overnight. The Russian response to the disaster was quick and um, uh, mostly focused on energy. As you know, the Japanese were forced to shut down or decided to shut down uh, most or all of their um, nuclear reactors. And Russia stepped up immediately and said that it, it would pull natural gas deliveries from other customers and, uh, and increase their deliveries to Japan in order to maintain Japan's energy or meet uh, Japan's energy needs. 70% of Russia's uh, natural gas exports, LNG exports in 2011, were sent to Japan. In June 2011, Ambassador Mikhail Bieli, who was the Russian ambassador to Japan, said that Russia remained committed to the 1956 Joint Declaration, the first statement in support of this uh, in years, and really you know, relieving the Japanese that, okay, so we haven't completely you know, lost this concession from the, from the Russians. In March 2012, Putin used a, ju a judo term uh, the judo term is kikewake, which means a draw. And another term, hajime, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing these, my apologies to the Japanese in the audience. Um, hajime means to start over again. So basically what he said in an interview was, we need this, we need to look for a draw in negotiations where both sides are happy and return, start over the negotiations that we had going on before. Prime Minister Noda, who was at the time Prime Minister of Japan, responded in the, jo in the diet saying that hikewake would not be possible if it was only two islands. <coughs> Effectively implying that there could be some sort of negotiated solution, but it would have to involve more than two islands. His foreign minister, Gemba, said that Japan was open to parallel talks on the islands. You remember what happened when the last time parallel talks arose, where they basically had said, we'll talk about Shikotan and Habamai's return on the one hand, and the future of Eitoroku and Kunishiri on the other hand, and for 10 years, uh, Japanese negotiations you know, fell apart uh, because of the, the domestic squabbling that that set off. <coughs> well, now we have a situation in which um, they are willing to return to that. In, uh, uh, Prime Minister Noda said that he planned to send as his representative to Russia to restart the negotiations former Prime Minister Mori. And Prime Minister Mori was very significant because it had been Mori in 2001 that had nailed down Putin's pledge to recognize uh, the 1956 Joint Declaration in something called the Irkutsk Declaration. They met in Irkutsk and the both sides basically said, we recognize the 1956 Joint Declaration as the key legal document uh, that lies at the base of these negotiations. So Mori had developed a very good relationship with Putin, had this great accomplishment, and, uh, and Noda wanted to send him as his personal representative. Both sides said that they wanted a quiet atmosphere surrounding these negotiations. Putin said, without provoking public opinion, most importantly, every time some sort of, of move was made here, you, you saw the press talking about the negotiations and basically they scotched the negotiations because uh, you know these sensitive, tender, diplomatic uh, maneuverings were destroyed when public opinion would come in and say, you can't do that. So both sides recognized, okay, look, we've got to do this in quiet. We can't do this you know, in the full view of day. So I'll just wrap up by saying that Shinzo Abe returned in December 2012 to become the eighth Japanese prime minister in a decade. Eighth prime minister in a decade. This was a key, a key complaint of the Russians that if your prime minister changes every year, we are never going to actually solve these problems. 
every prime minister seemed to have political problems at home that made it impossible for him to make the kind of political decision that was necessary to drive this through. Immediately, Abe said that he intended to sign a peace treaty with Russia, which Putin said was a very important signal. We value it highly. The both sides talked in a December phone call about making a or finding a mutually acceptable solution, i.e., one that both of us can, can accept. As or, uh, Abe said that he would send Mori as his special envoy to Russia, and Mori immediately started talking about Japan ought to consider this three plus one solution where Japan gets three islands and, uh, um, and the Russians keep one. Chief Cabinet Secretary Suga said that Mori was only speaking on his own opinion, but the press very quickly challenged that, saying any remark made by Mori could be perceived as coming from Abe. He's Abe's personal representative to the negotiations. And Abe did not try to correct uh, Mori at all. In February 2013, Mori met with Putin, welcomed his call for a draw, and at a speech at um, MGMO, one of the uh, Russian um, universities in Moscow, admitted that the return of all four islands to Japan would not be a draw. Effectively saying, if we're gonna get a draw here and we welcome a draw, we recognize that cannot result in all four islands in, to, in March of 2013, Mori repeated that a four to zero result would be a loss for one or the other side. He said, what would be important is for the Prime Minister and Mr. Putin to direct the foreign ministries of both countries to study concrete proposals that are neither a victory nor a defeat, but that can be accepted by both sides. Can Putin deliver on this? That's a fair question. His political fortunes have weakened in the last year or so as a result of domestic protests. And some have questioned whether he has the capacity domestically to make the kind of concessions that would be needed to drive this through. However, he has not wavered in his support for the 1956 Joint Declaration. So clearly, territorial concessions remain a part of his, uh, of his negotiating position with Japan. In April of 2013, Abe came to Russia the first sitting Japanese prime minister in 10 years to come to Russia. The two sides agreed to direct the foreign ministries to intensify negotiations quietly. Ambassador Panov declared a new start of negotiations that had been suspended since 2001. And most recently, on the 7th of February, i.e. just a couple of days ago, Prime Minister Aso Abe. Abe, thank you, uh, came to Sochi for the opening ceremonies of the Olympics on Northern Territories Day. This is the day that Japanese traditionally <coughs> protest the Russian occupation of the islands. And in the past, some foreign minister or some prime ministers have made speeches in support of Japan's claims, etc. This year, Abe was actually in Russia talking about uh, the prospect of a negotiated solution with the Russians. So the current trajectory of Russia-Japan's relationship in the, is the most promising it has been for more than a decade under the governments of uh, pro uh, President Vladimir Putin and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Despite an arguably weaker political position since controversial Duma elections of 2011, President Putin has held to his tw uh, 2000 recognition of the 1956 Joint Declaration and its stipulation that Moscow will return Shikotan and Habamai to Japan at the conclusion of a peace treaty that officially ends the state of war that has existed between the two countries since 1945. Moreover, his 2012 call for a draw, aware as he is that Japan does not return uh, regard the return of only Shikotan and Habamai as an acceptable compromise, suggests that Moscow may be open to what scholars have called a two plus alpha solution, with further negotiations needed to define that alpha. After a series of tantalizing moments dating back to 2006, 
when Russian officials were in a position to dismiss, to dismiss additional concessions, they did not. Shinzo Abe, meanwhile, has repeatedly voiced his belief that the two sides should pursue a mutually agreeable solution, which he certainly knows will not result in Japan receiving all four disputed islands. More importantly, his closest foreign policy advisors, Abe's, include some of Japan's most outspoken voices for constructive compromise. Taro Aso, you remember Foreign Minister Aso, then Prime Minister Aso, repeatedly corrected by the Foreign Ministry on this issue, is now currently serving as Deputy Prime Minister in Abe's government. And Yoshiro Mori is Abe's special emissary to Russia. Former Vice Foreign Minister Yachi is now Abe's key foreign policy advisor. So all of the figures who in the past have pushed for a negotiated solution are now back in power with Abe. Much remains to be seen in the coming year or two. The median tenure of Prime Minister Abe's 10 predecessors was exactly 419 days, or a little over a year. As of this month, actually when I was originally gave this in November, uh, nearly a year since he took office, Abe's popularity rating, according to the Yomiuri Shimbun, remained high at 72%. I think it still does. It's unclear how much of this political capital he is willing to spend on negotiations with Russia. Twelve years ago, his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, completely transformed the terms of bilateral relations when he accepted the terms of the 1956 Joint Declaration. <coughs> if Abe remains in office, it's enticing to imagine the two sides concluding a territorial agreement and final peace treaty in time for the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II in September 2015. Should that happen, please remember, you heard it here first. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. plus alpha. Um, what does that alpha look like? Uh, and what could it look like? I know we're speculating here. Um, and the second question, uh, in terms of the two islands that are presumably, if uh, um, the uh, if the scenario you describe unfolds, the, the, the ones that are subject to negotiation, do they have any strategic or economic um, value that would seem to suggest one side or another would be that this would be more than just political for uh, one or the other side. So the first question about what the, the, right. the alpha and the right. significance of the two. Okay, so um, these islands have two uh, key significances. I wonder, do I even need this? Yeah. There you go. Okay. Uh, so the, the main significance uh, of, the, of the two island or of the four islands right now is that they, they control about a billion dollars in fisheries. The Japanese have rights to fish in this area, but those rights are seriously constrained. And the uh, fishing communities on Hokkaido that basically fish these areas, this is incidentally one of the most productive fishing grounds in the entire world uh, around these four islands. And um, in fact, African poachers were just arrested uh, there uh, recently uh, with uh, tens of thousands of pounds of uh, illegally caught crab on board uh, just near the islands. So poachers come from all over the place. In any case, if the two islands are returned, that is to say Shikotan and Habamai, uh, Japan would actually get 40% of the fisheries rights in this area, so $400 million worth of fisheries mm -hmm. rights. That would totally transform the uh, lifestyle of the fishing, uh, fishing communities on Hokkaido. And it's why actually the people on, this is, this is too loud, sorry. Um, this is why the people on uh, Hokkaido are actually very strongly in support, or at least the, the fisheries communities are quite in support of this idea of just some kind of agreement that would actually bring in this kind of additional economic support. Uh, what would it look like if there was a, a, a two plus alpha solution? One solution would be to give them Kunashiri as well. 
So you would have uh, Shikotan, Habamai, and Kunashiri go to Japan, and Eituru who uh, stay with, with Russia. If that didn't happen, it could be possible to negotiate additional fisheries rights. Uh, and this has been something that has been uh, you know, very closely looked at in a lot of the scholastic literature that has been um, uh, put out on this topic. So that's sort of, those are the key two plus alpha solutions right now. There is some discussion also of joint uh, development of the islands, um, you know, may, maybe making Kunashiri a jointly, op, uh, uh, a jointly operated uh, island and that kind of thing. But this really is where the negotiations lie right now. The Eituropu and Kunashiri are the ones that are not resolved. <coughs> Shikotan and Habamai effectively are Japan's one at the end of all this. Eituropu, in most people's calculus, is going to remain with Russia. So really, these negotiations are about Kunashiri and the fate of Kunashiri, as well as the fisheries rights that lie around it. Strategically, this did used to be a very important component of Russia's um, uh, military defense. And it was important for the secure second strike in a nuclear exchange, because uh, Russia's nuclear submarines that would launch a secure second strike uh, were located in the Sea of Okhotsk. So they would sort of sail around in the Sea of Okhotsk. And if the islands, the, the Kuril Islands and these disputed islands, were controlled by Russia, it would be very difficult for American or Japanese ships to enter the Sea of Okhotsk and take out the submarines. This has become, as you might imagine, far less of a, of a major concern uh, in recent years. It, it is still raised by some, particularly in Russia, as a concern, but the truth is that if they return Shikotan and Habamai, they're already creating a weak link in that defensive uh, uh, position, and they've already expressed a willingness to do this. So it's hard to imagine that right now the strategic significance is really driving uh, these negotiations. But it does remain a, a component of the discussion uh, whenever this is raised. Did I, did I get those? Yes, you did. Okay. Um, so we have a question here. Uh, can you please identify yourself before you ask your question? Yes, I yeah, um, next to the microphone. Sorry. sorry. Thank you. Um, Ellen Frost, East West Center at National Defense University. Fascinating, not at all mind numbing. Um, <laughs> uh, quick comment. Uh, my sense from MOFA is, is that their intransigence, intransigence stems from what happened to Ambassador Togo and the colleagues that you that you mentioned. But um, I, I wonder if you'd speculate a bit on um, what would happen if there is an agreement reached. Um, on the Russian side, I've always been struck by the relative lack of interest in Asia. You know, Before they um, joined the East Asian Summit, they would say, oh, we're a Pacific power, we're a Pacific power. But the rest of the year, they'd be focused on Europe. Uh, do you think this might open up, um, sort of getting that out of the way might open up a more active Russian policy in Asia, or at least better image for Russia? And for Japan, um, if we've noticed some of Abe's right-wing instincts coming out, um, and if he has to compromise on the islands, um, do you see that that would enable him to be, be more assertive uh, on other kinds of issues in Asia? Uh, I, I'm deliberately inviting you to speculate on what would happen if there is a solution. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I think that, uh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm working at the Wilson Center right now, writing a book on Russia toward, uh, Russian policy toward Asia. So um, it would appear that I do think that Russia is serious about opening to Asia. Um, I, I do think, though, that it's important to recognize that um, Russia still remains a bit player in Asia, quite obviously. Uh, but I think that the focus of my, of my book, anyway, is to look at trend lines rather than uh, the actual uh, power of Russia at the moment. I think the trend lines suggest that it's very serious about expanding its uh, position in Russia, and, or sorry, in Asia. And I do think that this is um, uh, reflected in the seriousness with which it has pursued, well, first of all, the border treaty, treaty with, uh, with China. Um, it has expanded greatly its uh, trade relations, uh, as well as its own investment in uh, the Russian Far East in recent years. And it's, um, negotiations with the Japanese to resolve this, which is its last significant uh, territorial dispute anywhere. Um, these are all, you know, 
uh, evidence of Russia's growing commitment in Asia. So yeah, I, I do believe that. Um, as far as how, you know, what, what would be the fallout of this? Um, in Russia, the fallout over the uh, agreement with China was pretty loud for about a month. Uh, essentially, the local leaders were completely ignored in the, in the negotiations. And they were absolutely livid when it was announced that Russia and China had reached an agreement. And they screamed for a month about being ignored. And, and then finally Moscow said, well, you've had your fun, enough, clot it. You know, shut up, we've got a good agreement here, live with it. And you know, that's basically what happened. And I suspect very strongly that, um, that Putin's approach to this would be similar. Now, in 2004, 2005, when the Chinese border agreement was, was cut, Putin was arguably in a stronger domestic position. And you know whether that would fly for him in this current situation as well uh, remains to be seen. But I do think that that will be his approach. Uh, and he may be trading on the fact that not many people really care as much about, uh, about what goes on uh, on, the, on the fringes, on the periphery with Japan as they did you know, in uh, and even there, it was only a month of uh, you know, serious bones. Um, in Japan, it's a different question, really. Um, Japanese domestic policy has been the weak link in these negotiations for a long, long time. And it has compromised Japan's capacity to respond in a way that the Russians would consider meaningful. Uh, if Abe makes a compromise, you can look at it in one of two ways. It would solidify his northern border with Russia. It would improve his relationship with Russia, uh, and arguably allow him to focus more intensively on the border disputes that Japan has currently with South Korea and and China, without being you know uh, without the concerns that surround the Russian border. On the other hand, some have argued that it could establish a precedent of Japanese concessions in territorial disputes. And you know, do they want to accept that kind of a, of a, of a situation? Um, the truth is that right now, the Japanese are in an all or nothing solution. And right now, the Russians have everything. So if the Japanese do manage to negotiate a compromise solution that gets them two islands or, or three islands, uh, one could spin that mm -hmm. as a tremendous right. improvement on the current situation, particularly if you've got $500 billion worth of fishing, or $500 million a year of fisheries uh, resources coming your way. So it's all going to depend on spin and the level of, of domestic support that Abe uh, continues to enjoy. Yep. Uh, Matt, I think you have some stuff in the mic. Gil Rosman, uh, now at the Hassan Forum, where we have been covering this issue, as you know, with Ambassador Togo taking the lead. Mm -hmm. And of course, he, uh, he's been pressing this optimistic view uh, and you are carrying that forward in the U.S. in a way that no one, I think, has, has done so. And I think you've done a very fine job. But I think there's some issues that could be developed further. Um, the first one is Alpha. Uh, it seems to me both sides think the other side needs this deal more. And therefore, it's going to be pretty hard to get the Alpha. Uh, they both, the discussion in both sides is essentially uh, Japan is desperate because of its struggle with China, uh, and, uh, they, and and Put and maybe Putin can get away with two islands and no serious alpha, just a smokescreen alpha. Mm -hmm. And in the Japan side, they they have this notion that Russia is so worried about China, even though the Russians won't talk about it, that uh, Russia needs this deal and Putin. And, and that's so that's one issue. Now we go to the geopolitics. Uh, it seems to me that. Um, both countries have reasons to get this deal because they're trying to make a point to their allies. So I would say Japan-U.S. tensions over history and their uh, uh, Abe's desire to get a carte blanche to do whatever he wants on the revisionist front after Yasukuni um, gives him reason to want to show the U.S. that he can have another partner. And you haven't discussed really the geopolitical themes uh, and whether they, they add up to a deal or, or not. Um, and, uh, and then 
seems to me that Japan is looking at this especially from the point of view of geopolitics and, and identity, and Russia is looking at it from the point of view of energy and economics and identity, and how well do those, do they get what they want, or is this a kind of deal that doesn't really have much follow-up in those other dimensions? And finally, the war issue. After all, Russia took a hard line against Abe's visit to Yasukuni and reminded Japan of its 1945 defeat and how it has to accept the position of the defeated country, uh, which has some uh, territorial implications. Uh, and now Japan is pressing the, the war memory issue in new ways. That, does that complicate reaching a decision that essentially is a resolution of 1945? For those of you who don't know Gil Rosman, his book is one of the most important in this <coughs> field, and he is unquestionably the most important scholar in the country on, on the issue. Um, so. Uh, I have just been cornered by the best. Um, uh, so thank you, Gil. Um, and, and I'm not sure I'm going to get through all of these, but um, they're excellent questions. Let me see what I can do. Um, so, Alpha, uh, who needs to deal more? Is Japan desperate? Uh, is this a smokescreen Alpha? Um, Russia recognizes that just giving back two islands is not going to work. Um, I think the Russians recognize that some sort of, uh, um, some kind of alpha, whether it's a smokescreen alpha or not, uh, will, be, uh, will be necessary. Now, what would a smokescreen alpha look like? I'm not really sure, actually. No one's ever actually, uh, no one's ever said to me, well, that, that would just be a smokescreen. What would that be? Like an additional 10% of the fisheries rights? Would that be considered a smokescreen because it didn't give any more territory back? Um, would joint development of one of the islands be considered a smokescreen? Um, I do think that somehow the Japanese government needs a face-saving solution. Um, and so I think the Japanese might actually agree to a smokescreen alpha, uh, what you might consider a smokescreen alpha. Um, and they wouldn't obviously call it a smokescreen alpha. But um, once again, getting $400 million worth of fisheries in a year uh, is going to be a, an enormous boon alongside the you know two islands, you could spin that pretty well. So it's not going to take, I would think, a whole lot more in order for the Japanese to declare some kind of victory and to say this is clearly better than no progress uh, of any kind. Um, the argument that the, that the, that the uh, I think both sides at this point recognize that neither one really needs this deal. I think both sides have moved on to the point where they're doing it because they want to. Um, the Japanese do not require a resolution of this deal. Um, and the Russians know that. And they know that the Japanese won't surrender much to get it. The, the <coughs> question of energy is, is a sort of a separate issue. Uh, the, the two sides have, have been negotiating LNG exports to, to Japan. And really, that hinges on the whole question of what American shale gas uh, um, volumes and prices are going to, to come at. It's not, it, it has <coughs> little to do with the question of do we get a territorial dispute first or, will, or uh, sorry, resolution first or does this lead to a territorial res resolution. I think they're relatively separate. Similarly, the notion about Russia being worried about China is desperately believed in, in, um, in, in Japan, but it's, it's, um, it's not true. The Russians do not in fact, trust Japan more than China, uh, and they do not, in fact, regard Japan as a uh, potential ally against China. Um, and I think gradually the Japanese are coming around to recognizing that. There's a great desire in Japan for Russia to sort of recognize that it could face a problem with China, so therefore it should improve relations with Japan. That's simply not the case in Moscow. Um, geopolitically, I simply don't believe that the Japanese are doing this as a, um, a way of separating themselves from the United States, uh, currying favor with the Russians, um, uh, demonstrating their own independence. I simply don't believe that that is a significant element in this, in this um, decision on the part of the Japanese. Um, 
I do think that it is interesting that, that Abe went to uh, Russia for the opening ceremonies at a time when the United States and many European leaders were staying away for all of the reasons that everybody knows about. Um, however, I think it was more of an effort to take advantage of this chance to press forward the negotiations and the energy deals and all the rest of, of the things that Japan considers important. I think it, it wasn't an effort to distance itself from the United States. Um, and on the war issue, I'm, I'm admittedly skipping a little of this, Gil. I apologize, but I'll talk to you about them later. Um, on the war issue, uh, it is a standard statement of fact that the Russians say every time these negotiations happen that um, Japan simply has to accept that legally it's on untenable ground when it makes a claim against Ekaterinburg and Kumashiri because it surrendered all claim to the Kuril Islands in the San Francisco Peace Treaty. The Japanese will say, well, we don't recognize the Kuril Islands as, um, or as including Ekaterinburg and Kumashiri. However, their own research analysts did at MOFA in the late 1940s in the run-up to the San Francisco Peace Treaty. Japanese historians have demonstrated this in publications that are now a decade old, that the Japanese government did recognize at the time of the San Francisco Peace Treaty that Eitorofu and Kunishiri were part of the Kuril Islands and were therefore surrendered with no claims to uh, Russia at the end of World War II. Um, so Russia likes to remind the Japanese that they're standing on shaky legal ground as a way of saying, if we negotiate this, it's not because we must or because our occupation is illegal or any other legal thing. It's because we are doing this as a, as a gesture of good relations, one to the other, uh, and, and nothing further. I think we have time for one more question. Over here. Hi, I'm Charlie Bearer with the Stimson Center. Uh, you do say that you think the, the LNG negotiation process is staying reasonably separate from anything territorial at the moment, but do you see that as possible to bring in as a kind of alpha, or is that something that those negotiations are already far enough advanced and there's already enough of a relationship on energy issues that Russia can't really back away and start to withhold that for concessions? You know what, Charlie, this is actually an intriguing idea because um, time is not on Russia's side here. The Japanese are trying to delay a long-term treaty on LNG with the Russians. The Russians are still old school in LNG treaties. They like to do them multi-year and lock in prices and you know, essentially take advantage of the current situation and make it last as long as they possibly uh, in discussions with the, with the Japanese, what they're effectively trying to do is, is lock in long-term LNG contracts before the United States begins exporting shale gas in large amounts. Everybody recognizes, and even the Russians are starting to come to terms with this, that when the U.S. starts exporting shale gas, particularly to its Asian partners, uh, that, the price of, uh, that their price point uh, for exports is going to um, be compromised and that they won't be able to match U.S. Uh, prices. So their chance, if they, if they wait as long as the Japanese want to wait, of being competitive is limited. If they could find some way to nail down a long-term contract now, that would be very much in, in Russia's favor. If that could be used to push negotiations forward, and if the Japanese were willing to pay that kind of a premium, and in previous years they have been willing, during the Yeltsin administration there was discussion of billions of dollars of assistance and whatnot in order to push these negotiations. Um, that could be an alpha. On that note, thank you very much, Matthew, for the very interesting remarks, and uh, thank you all for coming today.